Welcome, listeners. I am so thankful to have attorney Joseph Wilmore with me today. And the thing that I kind of love is I'm going to learn more about Joseph as we go here, too. We, he is a divorce attorney in California, so we both work to, with divorces. We do things differently. Um, you know, I'm a divorce mediator. Joseph is more of an advocate. So the thing that I like, though, is when I talked to Joseph briefly before we got on, is that he said it's really important to him to make his clients feel comfortable. And I love that. And that is just so in line with me and with this podcast. So we are going to kind of talk all things divorce and talk about mediation and, you know, representing clients. So Joseph, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, you know, Joseph, what I usually do with my clients is there's usually kind of a backstory as to how you decided to get into family law. Is that, Do you have a, a story about why you decided to do family law? You know, I don't know very many people that go to law school dreaming of being a divorce attorney. And I cannot say that was the case for me as well, because I certainly did not dream of becoming a divorce attorney. In fact, you know, here in California, I didn't even take community property law in law school because I had no interest in, in family law whatsoever. So I fell into family law. Uh, by kind of going the route that, you know, they, they tell you to do in law school is that you need to get a job uh, in big law. That's the dream. And, and live your life happily working 90 hours a week right. at, a law, at a big law mill. And I did get that big job. I had relocated to Arizona to take it, which is where I'm from. So I'm licensed in California and Arizona. And after about a year of doing that, I was so burned out. I was wondering what I did. Uh, wondered why I moved back to Arizona as well. Uh, so I... Uh, Quit that job, came back to San Diego and went solo. And like the typical solo practitioner hanging their own shingle, made that mistake that every solo practitioner does is I practice every area of law. So I essentially marketed myself as an everything attorney. And the first case that I took was a divorce case uh, as a solo practitioner. And that's kind of how I found out, okay, well, this is actually an area of law that's interesting to me because mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a trial attorney. Uh, that was always my objective. And of course, there's only a few areas of law where you really are in, in court a lot. So then after about a year of doing that, I was only taking family law cases uh, here in California to become a certified specialist. You can do so after five years in practice, uh, along with, of course, professional credentials, trying a minimum number of cases and so forth, which I had done. So five years in practice, I became a certified specialist. Uh, and at this point, I have just celebrated my 10 year anniversary Yay. as a practicing attorney. Well, and I love that. And I, I am, I am such a believer in sticking to that one thing. And I know in my practice, I only do mediations mm -hmm. and that's, that makes it possible for me to learn and grow and really hone in on those skills. So I think that that really does make you an expert in your field, you know, because it's, it's all you're doing all day long. So absolutely. Um, can you, and can you kind of explain to the listeners what do your cases normally look like? Because in my situation, the couple comes to me together and we go through their divorce paperwork. They do a joint petition or we do a marital mediation where we don't even get divorced, but kind of help them work through some issues. Okay. So in your case, what do your clients look like and what does it look like when they um, come to you? Well, I have um, essentially a wide variety of client clients of all different socioeconomic backgrounds, some which would be considered celebrity clients to your, you know, stay at home parents. Uh, there's a large military presence here in San Diego in particular. So a number of military clients, public service employees, a wide basis of clients. So here in California in particular, I, I would say 
I'm not saying that divorce is easy anywhere, but California always overcomplicates everything. So even for very simple cases, uh, it's very hard to get judgments pushed through the court without an attorney. Uh, most of my cases, we are able to at least resolve and settle some issues within the case. Uh, most cases, I would say at least one or two issues are set for trials, and that could be limited solely to children or, or some financial issues. Now, of course, uh, laws vary by state with regard to property division. Most states on the West Coast, of course, are community property uh, states, including California. So most, qu quite frankly, most property division issues should never be set for trial here because they're so easy to figure out. And that that's really only with those clients that simply are fighting for the sake of fighting that end up trying issues like that. that you so know, it's can you so easy to figure out. Tell me, okay, go in there a little deeper because um, why is that so easy? Don't isn't it still tricky because couldn't they be fighting over what asset they want? You and know? that's where uh, somebody such as yourself uh, comes into to, to do a tremendous service for these clients because because mediation on issues that are important to clients, say, for example, a house. And the, the wife wants the house mm -hmm. and she's emotionally attached to the house. Uh, she's financially capable of buying the husband's financial interest out in the house. And, and some other assets are more important to husband that he wants. Uh, that, that's where negotiating these issues is important. And quite frankly, in both of their best interests, because if that case were set for trial, a judge does not care. Uh, here in California, a judge would just take each item by item and say, all right, we're going to divide your financial interest in this. And with regard to a house, for example, that one spouse really would want, uh, a judge doesn't care. A judge would say, well, I'm ordering the house sold and you guys split the proceeds. Okay. I have a question. So are you saying that because I find that it's easier for my clients to like maybe leave the 401k and take a different asset. They kind of structure how they want to divide things up. You're not saying that they have to divide everything in half, each asset. Like if you have three 401ks, that's not what you're saying, is it? If the case were set for trial okay. and there was no agreement on oh, those assets, then a court gotcha. would likely do that. Of course, when we try to settle these issues, we would just look at equalizing the division so they don't have to go down that in doing, um, you know, dividing each of those item by item. Right. Because ultimately, of course, we can always equalize the division as far as what, what each spouse's interest is in those assets without having to slice everything. On Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that because <laughs> that was what I was thinking. And I did want to, I did want to add to that. Um, I also, all of my clients, they sign off on an agreement to mediate with me, must take the divorce paperwork that we work on together to attorneys Mm -hmm. so that they can get that advice. So there is that I don't send them to file their paperwork on their own. A lot of them would like to, but I want them to get that representation. So I do use a, or they use attorneys, mm -hmm. um, you know, of their choice or I can recommend people. So, um, yeah, because I didn't want you to think that 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 wasn't a piece to mine. You know, okay. so it sounds yeah. like we're kind of. Um, kind of could be working together if we were both in California. Of course, <laughs> probably, <laughs> yes. And I think we'd work well together too. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. Okay. So um, you were saying that most of your cases, they settle like half of the issues. So right, when you're, you're just representing one party, husband or wife. Correct. Is the other party generally represented by another attorney or not? Generally, yes. Uh, and in my opinion, that generally makes the case go smoother as well. Uh, of course, I know most of the attorneys in the area, so I can 
I already have an idea if this is an attorney that is uh, going to be reasonable, going to bring good faith settlement offers forward, or is one of those attorneys that likes to dump gasoline on fire and just right. drive up conflict uh, and drive up litigation costs. So, and, and why I say it's easier for that's what me I was just going to ask I, you. Read my mind. An attorney, uh, it's good because that party knows and and understands the laws that apply. So, when I deal with a self-represented individual, they are often speaking based on emotion. They are they don't understand uh, oftentimes how the law works or what the likely results will be. So for example, if we are talking about spousal supports and I'm representing a stay-at-home mom that hasn't had a job for 20 years and the husband is refusing to get an attorney, I can handle this myself, I refuse to settle this issue. I won't pay her a dime, she needs to go get a job. Now, of course, we would analyze the factors that apply to wife in this situation. Is uh, a stay-at-home mom, say she has very limited education, is she capable of getting a, a job that requires years of experience, uh, say, an a, a education that she does not have? Of course not. Here in California, we would look at a rehabilitative period that she needs uh, yeah. to, to obtain education, experience, and so forth to get to a period of self-sufficiency. So had there been an attorney representing husband, it's highly likely that attorney would say, hey, you're going to be paying spousal support for a period of time. Let's talk numbers. Okay. And I love that you're saying this too, because... That is one of the things that because I am an attorney, when I work with my clients, I let them know that I'm a neutral, but that I can give them legal information so I can tell them what the law is, right, regarding mm -hmm. spousal maintenance and child support. I just can't advise them. So I, I find that they're, so, they're educated when they go yeah. to the attorney, which is so helpful. So thank you for mentioning that. And that just kind of makes me feel better knowing that my clients do have that, you know, rather than someone off the street who absolutely wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't be and, able to. And I think that's a, a tremendous service to the public too, as far as looking at this, because again, oftentimes, and it, it's understandable, we're, we're not all experts in everything. Right. So it, it's important for us to seek out those experts so that we do understand what is really going to apply in this situation rather than, well, I heard from somebody else that, right. that, and of course, every situation is different. It is. And there are, the good thing too, is there's so many resources available now on divorce, I think, but it's sometimes tricky for people because it's just such an emotional, yeah, absolutely. you know, terrifying time. And so I just, you know, we, we kind of talked about um, spousal support or maintenance or alimony or whatever you want to call it. Can you tell me, I have this like heart for children and a big piece of why I do what I do is because I want the parents to be able to communicate well so that they can parent together. How, have you ha found, what have you found with your clients and how is that working when they're each represented by an attorney? Are they coming up with, you know, parenting plans or what's the, what do you do in those situations? Yes. And here in California, and my understanding is this is pretty commonplace throughout the country, is obviously the family code isn't so much concerned about either of the parents' interests is having a parenting schedule that serves the child's best interests. We need a parenting schedule that will give them a stable routine uh, and make sure they're able to get to school, make sure that they're able to function. And say we had parents that had been married for a, a good period of time, uh, but the children were used to a routine that involved much more one parent versus the other. And this could have simply been based right. on one parent traveling for a job a lot, say we have one parent who is out of town at least half the month 
and simply unable to personally care for the child. Now, is a parent, now, even though that parent might want, hey, I want equal time with my, my child, but can that parent actually fulfill a parenting schedule where they're able to care for that child at, at an equal amount of time? And based on those facts, it sounds almost impossible. The child would likely be in the care of whether other family members or a babysitter. And is that in the child's best interest to be cared for by somebody else aside from a parent? Of course, the court's going to say that the child should always be uh, in the care of a parent unless there's some factor that would that the parent is unfit or unsafe. Can I ask you a question? <clears throat> in California, is child support affected by the amount of overnights the kiddos are with the parents or the amount of time they spend, or is it on the percentage of income? So it's, it's uh, of course, three factors, I would say, is we look at uh, mom's income, uh, okay. dad's income, and the percentage of parenting time. Okay, they so they with. all. So we do calculate quite specifically what the amount of time is each parent spends with the child. and. Uh, here, of course, that is a guideline number. So whatever calculation we reach with regard to that, that will be the amount that the court is bound by the family court to order. Okay. Now, of course, attorneys, we have the ability to argue what should be considered income or not income. I know. Yeah. What is a parent's earning ability? But once the court has decided based on attorney argument what each parent's respective income or earning ability is uh, and the percentage of parenting time, that is the order as well. And then again, we argue, are the parents actually following the custody order as well? And then that can affect, of course, the calculation as well. Right, right. Well, and I want to let you know, I actually have an online course that is a parenting plan. It's very in-depth. And it's not a legal document, but people bring it into their legal document and it helps people. It's kind of me being there, even though I'm not there yeah. and it helps them keep in mind the best interests of their kids and come up with a schedule and a holiday schedule. And then, I mean, it's, it's an, it's long, it's a, a long document, but it's addressing things that they may not think about. Like things like one parent wants the, COVID vaccine and one doesn't, you know, what are you going to do in that scenario? When are you going to give them um, phones or, you know, it's just, it talks yeah, about yeah. so many. So I don't know if that's something that you utilize, but I find that my parents feel relief to know that they have a plan that they can turn to in the future and look at it. Not that it can't be changed if they both agree, but um, I don't know if that would ever be anything that was useful to your clients, but I think it is an amazing gift to co-parents. You're, you're absolutely correct, too, on that, because when parents enter this situation, of course, that they've never been in before, they don't think about all these, these situations that come up. And... These can be simple issues, such as which which can seem obvious to us as attorneys. Right. Or why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you think about the holidays or right. or the exchange locations for children or uh, what vaccines you want? What uh, what doctors you want them mm -hmm. to go to? Do you want them to have braces? Yes. Uh, private schooling or what school period they go to? All these things that. Uh, when you are married to somebody or in a relationship, raising a right. child together, they happen organically. It's, it's just a given. But when you are in separate households, you, you don't think of all these things until you're in that situation right. and you have a disagreement and you need to work that out. Yeah. Yeah. But again, if you can at least settle those issues kind of in an early stage or have a written agreement that they exactly. can always turn to in that event, that saves them from having to run back to court on I every know. small issue and have a judge decide that. Yes. And I love it because I've noticed that I have clients that will sneak back in to my, my safe portal and take a look at that parenting mm -hmm. plan because they want to see, well, what did we say? And they know that. If they want to change it, they absolutely can as long as they both agree, but that it's there and it's it helps them. You know, it's just absolutely. an amazing tool for as you move through parenting together. So I love that that that's a piece of your practice, too. And now, Joseph, we're kind of coming to the end and I have what I call my saddle up segment. 
So what I do is I have my guests tell my listeners what is something that they can do right now to move forward, um, you know, kind of to get beyond this and, and better themselves, even if it's through divorce or, or whatever. I think we should actually, uh, and my my piece of advice on this, since we talked about children to a really good deal, yeah. uh, or rather I should say to a, a pretty substantial extent, is on the issue of co-parenting. And if you're in a situation where you are unhappy in your marriage and divorce is inevitable and you are concerned about the children, uh, which you should be, <laughs> right? children will thrive much better in two happy households uh, than in a household where they're continuing to witness their parents fight all the time and they just sense the tension and unhappiness. Now, of course, when you move into those two households, it's really important, of course, for the parents to put their personal feelings for each other aside, focus on what's in the best interest of the children, and essentially look at the other parent now as a business partner. Exactly. And, and your business venture here is to raise your children together uh, as best as possible and with your focus on seeing these children thrive and become uh, successful adults and, of course, productive members of society and living happy lives because I believe that's what every parent wants and that's the steps that every parent needs to do to make sure that happens. And the easier and better they do and work together, uh, the more likely and the more successful those children will be at, at growing up and, and doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's something I, that every parent needs to keep in mind. Is that oh, I totally Put agree. your personal feelings for the other parent aside, focus on your children. Remember, the other parent is thinking they're doing what's best for the child as well. I presume you think you're doing what's best for your child as well. You guys need to work together toward understanding each other's perspectives and really working together collaboratively to make sure your children thrive. You are speaking my language. I love that. So now, Joseph, so you, you work in California. Do you also work in Arizona? I do not. So my practice is limited to, Air, uh, to California. Now, pre-COVID, I would say I only took cases in Southern California. So that would be Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, uh, Riverside County is the, the primary areas I've I've served since we are in a much much more virtual world now. That has expanded. So on a case by case basis, of course, th there may be other cases throughout the state. Uh, but I am primarily, of course, focused here in California, and that is where I practice. All right. Well, tell me, Joseph, if our listeners want to find you, and I will put it in the show notes, but what's the best way to get a hold of you? All right. Well, you're always welcome to call. Should I read off my phone number? <laughs> or will that Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So you're always welcome to give our office a call. Our number is 619-550-6738. Uh, our website is wilmorelawfirm.com. And you can find me on Instagram. I am a entertaining personality, I would say, for a lawyer. Uh, and my Instagram handle is joseph.wilmore. Two else. All, right. All right. Hey, do you do any TikToks yet? I do TikToks as well. Uh, my Instagram account seems much more... Vibrant. And just yes. vibrant, I would say, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, listeners, if you are in California and need some family law support, find Joseph. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.